Welcome to the welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you tonight to our festivities that we engage in on every Saturday night. The college consists of the following format. We'll have a first, a brief announcements period. Second, we will then have our speaker, Mr. Mike Ryan, who will then speak about the climate tonight. And then after that, there'll be a question and answer period, which will be questions to the speaker and back. Then we will have our infamous rebuttal period where each of you will get a certain set amount of time to rebut our speaker. And then generally we finish up about nine o'clock and I usually keep the Zoom call open for a while to for anybody else who wants to chat afterwards. Uh, there are two rules to the college. One is no personal attacks. And the second one is, uh, one I'm sorry, first one is one fool at a time. And the second one is no personal attacks. So with yeah. that, Shirley, if you're ready, uh, let's get the announcement started. Let me get my uh, browser here ready to uh, get the college going. And still, let's get started here, Mr. Charlie. If you're ready. All right. Welcome to meeting number 3,676 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, I uh, just want to remind everyone that we have a Google email group, which you are invited to subscribe to. Instructions are at the top center of our main website. Also, there's a meetup group, which functions in much the same fashion. You will receive one or two emails in advance of programs, alerting you as to the topic and not much traffic. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. On July 30th, we'll be visited by Justin Tucker of the Libertarian Party to outline updates on the recent adaptions, recently adopted Libertarian Party platform. That's on July 30th. On August the 6th, we'll have an academic from Illinois Wesleyan College talking about the philosophies of money. So it would be an economic evening there, uh, August the 6th. August the 13th, we're writing, we're waiting on Brian Nenehy. He's going to be talking about constitutional issues. So it should be a very interesting program. A variety of matters are presently before uh, our third body of government. A uh, great deal of traffic and news regarding those issues. Uh, on August the 20th, just booked it, the Illinois Green Party will come and present their platform. I've just finished the PowerPoint. We're recruiting a number of knowledgeable, uh, ecologically, politically uh, oriented speakers. This should be a program. Do not, you do not want to miss this. It looks really good, very informative. Really. Um, and on July, on August the 27th, uh, the topic also again, will be ecologically. We're gonna talk about setting up community solar panels in your neighborhood. So you could say goodbye to ComEd and you could run your own utility company, you and your pals uh, in your neighborhood. That's on August the 27th. That's the Citizens Utility Board, uh, which we'll be uh, presenting. Um, on September the 3rd, uh, we will have our special Labor Day speaker. I will be speaking on the history of the factory. Another one to miss. And the history, if you wish, of the exploitation of capitalism. Uh, but this is a really good PowerPoint. Very informative, well, many, many things I learned regarding it, but it's the history of the factory. Uh, and development in this nation beginning around 17 in the, in the 1700s. Um, let's see, uh, okay, that leaves us open. Our next open dates then 
are September 10, 17, and 24. So if you'd like to get on the schedule, please send me a title and a brief description of your presentation. <laughs> That's it, Tim. Take it away. Thank you, sir. Okay. And uh, Mike Ryan, uh, you <clears throat> want to introduce yourself, share your screen. Again, everybody mute while the speaker is speaking so we can have his undivided attention. And uh, Mike, please introduce yourself and let's uh, get going here. How do you do that? Just click. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Mike. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to speak here tonight. Uh, I'll give uh, about 30 minutes on, on uh, this discussion around uh, presentation on climate change, and then uh, we'll open it up to all the, all the Q&A. Uh, uh, let me get the pointer out here. Here's the uh, agenda. I will just give you a brief overview of Citizens Climate Lobby, which I'm a member of in the Chicagoland area and uh, talk a little bit about the climate change issues, and that is why CO2 matters, what the evidence of climate change is, what the consequences are. Talk a little bit about the uh, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And then I'm gonna talk about carbon fee and dividend as a potential solution. Uh, we'll talk not just about, and, and of course, then the global impact of having a green economy from a health and an economics point of view. And then as part of that carbon fee and dividend discussion, and then, you know, will carbon fee and dividend be accepted? Uh, what do people think about it? Uh, and where are we in Congress as of right now? on this particular effort, carbon fee and dividend, and then climate change legislation in general. And then I'll talk about some actions that we can take based on where we are in Congress, and then we'll have the, the Q&A. So uh, CCL, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, my interest in uh, CCL began about four or five years ago. Uh, I scuba dive in in reading more about what's happening to the oceans and the, with the increased temperatures, the, the increased acidity killing off an enormous amount of the coral reef and therefore the ocean ecosystem, I really became a lot more interested in what I could do to help out on the climate change policy side. Uh, also, the other thing that really interests me is the economic side of it. There's a big, uh, if we do this the right way, we can, we can really have a, uh, we, there's a, is a tremendous God creator, not just here, but internationally. Uh, from a CCL perspective, our, our, our focus is really to change national policy to address climate change. Uh, good news is, I mean, things can be changed. The future is hopeful. Uh, it, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan grassroots advocacy organization. We have about, actually, this is a we have about 300,000 volunteers, uh, a significant number of chapters in the, in the uh, US and Canada. And what we do typically from an action point of view is we will uh, put together letters to the editor. We will lobby at the local, the state and the federal level. Uh, we'll do outreach events like this, just trying to help people understand what we do and some of the things that are happening around climate policy. And you know, the idea here is that uh, every movement in the history of the world has begun with uh, words uh, that have led to movement, which is where we're at now in the climate policy area, which eventually leads to change. So uh, we've got to start somewhere and, and we're, we're making progress. So that's just a brief overview of CCL. Um, this slide, talks about you know, why CO2 matters. So when we burn fossil fuel, coal, oil, gas, uh, that increases the CO2 in the atmosphere. That CO2 acts like a greenhouse that traps the heat in the atmosphere. The, the sun comes in and, and not all of the heat that is necessary that ought to escape is able to escape. Consequently, the planet warms. Uh, and from 1880 all the way up through present day, uh, the, the, uh, the 
the Earth has warmed uh, a fair amount, uh, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, at, you know, one one plus degrees Celsius. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is important here is that without the man-made pollution, that is the CO2 from, from burning fossil fuels, if you look at the factors that drive natural change, volcanic eruptions, small changes in the brightness of the sun, uh, that tell us the Earth should have actually cooled a little bit since pre-industrial time. And uh, so the bottom line here is that the increase is, is in this temperature is, is human made. Um, and the, if we look at kind of what's happening out there today uh, in, and over the last several years, we're seeing more frequent severe weather. Uh, this, you know, from the, the heat, the droughts, the flash flooding, the wind damage, uh, the extreme wildfires. Uh, we're seeing dirtier air, higher disease, higher death rates, higher wildlife extinction rates. And as I said earlier, more acidic oceans, which are killing off the coral reef. The, um, we just look in the Midwest, you know, this is an older example, but nonetheless, an issue with climate change. But back in 2018, the extreme flooding throughout the entire Midwest. Uh, if you look at things more, a little more broadly, uh, if we look at the mega fires, if we look at California, uh, 1999, a million acres burned, 2007, a million and a half, 2018, 2 million, 2024 million. And in, in many cases, the air is so dry that it evaporates, that rain evaporates often before it hits the ground. Uh, it's becoming very expensive. Uh, not just, of course, on the rebuilding, uh, but it's, the, it's more difficult to get insurance. In some places, it's just not available. Um, you look at more internationally, Australia, uh, they are being severely impacted by climate change. Uh, recent fires in the last couple of years, 21% of the world heritage forest destroyed. You know, that's an area three quarters the size of Illinois. Three billion animals killed or displaced, and, and it you know, lasting about 240 days before it was finally extinguished. And then, you know, from a flooding point of view, uh, if we look at just the summer, a uh, 2020 summer, 23 extreme storms or hurricanes, which is two times the normal number in the Atlantic Basin. Here's the Atlantic Basin, Florida, Mid Atlantic, Upper. Northeast here, uh, and 2021 was very similar. Uh, internationally, uh, Bangladesh, Dhaka, the capital, a uh, good example here of the flooding that was happening in late July that year. Uh, but 30% of Southeast Asia is only five meters above sea level. So, so they are very vulnerable. Uh, and, and I was looking at my uh, looking at the looking at my phone earlier and just looking at the headlines. Uh, we, we're all aware of what's been happening the last week and what's expected to have continue over the next week with the extreme heat around the world. Europe is being hit hard. Uh, the U.S., 100 million people are in an extreme situation. Uh, but there are a number of headlines on there today as well. Um, so just a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the evidence and what's happening out there, point of view. The, um, it, we, we are in an urgent situation. Um, we, we have, when, when we look at the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their report, uh, their most recent one from the UN, uh, we have about eight years to really cut global emissions in half to really avoid the most catastrophic effect uh, and, and that come from allowing the temperature to increase even more than we're able to to, to limit it at, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the good news here is that we do have policy available, we do have technology available to cut emissions and dramatically boost the economy at the same time. Um, the IPCC, they recommend a, uh, a systemic change to our system, and that is putting a price on carbon 
is critical to reducing emissions. And I'm going to talk about what that means in a moment. Uh, and then, of course, within this global environment, and uh, if, if the U.S. leads, the world will follow. We have, still have a lot of leverage to pull the rest of the world along, albeit, it, of course, it is a challenge. Um, one of the uh, one of the points, you know, as, as we talk about this carbon fee and dividend, I think a good way to explain what it is and how it works, uh, what the benefits of it are, is to talk about uh, just take a particular bill that has been in Congress for a few years and talk about what it is and how and and, and therefore how carbon fee and dividend work. Uh, the, one, the example that I'm using here is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Its goal was to reduce, and, and this came out, uh, was reintroduced again a couple of years ago, but uh, to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030, and then be at net zero by 2050. This is what the UN IPCC report recommends, that if we want to limit the increase in the temperature to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, and that is a challenge. We've, we've got to do this, uh, hit these targets. So what is this? Uh, you know, there are 96 co-sponsors, uh, but four of them, the local four in Illinois right here. Um, but it, you know, just kind of getting into what this whole thing is, if we look at how it works, first of all, it, it places a fee on fossil fuels at the first point of sale. Basically, the, you know, you can start at different dollar amounts per metric ton, but they're recommending $15 per metric ton. And then Congress has asked, would ask the regulators to identify key points where greenhouse gases are produced, are distributed and used, it can be assessed a fee with minimum administrative burden. Uh, what does that mean? You know, the fee would be assessed at the main choke points upstream, meaning, you know, where do we burn fossil fuels to produce energy? Uh, where do we burn fossil fuels to produce goods and services, like at an aluminum plant, steel plant, cement? chemical plant, uh, you know, they may assess a fee midstream, you know, choke points such as groups like UPS or USPS or Amazon that have large vehicle fleets uh, and those that are not moving over to hybrid or electric, you know, may, perhaps they may be assessed uh, a fee, but it's up to the, you know, the civil servants, you know, to identify this. Uh, but that's the main idea. Uh, so with a carbon tax, uh, it is just simply a market-based solution, which is one of the attractive points about it. You know, it's predictable for businesses so they can plan and allocate their capital, just like today's tax system, just like all the other tax issues they're dealing with. Uh, it's, it puts a simple price on carbon emissions and then it just simply lets the free market do the rest. Meaning, you know, what does that mean? Well, you know, the, the companies that produce energy from fossil fuel uh, and provide it to the rest of the world, uh, you know, they are going to get charged a fee. They will quickly start to invest heavily in alternative sources of energy to sell for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, they want to keep their costs down. There was a little uh, fly crawling across here, sorry. Uh, you know, they want to keep their costs down and their profits up, but they also need to be able to meet the demand for that lower priced energy. So you have companies, manufacturers of goods and services that buy energy to make their stuff. And they're going to start looking for uh, and increase their demand for more cost effective alternative sources of energy so they can keep their costs down as well. And then, of course, consumers, you know, as long as we have choices in the market, we'll, we will only accept a small increase in prices from, you know, such a fee before we start to shop around for those alternative sources of goods, uh, you know, other products, 
that are a little bit cheaper because they're, they are being made with alternative uh, energy. Uh, so the another critical point here, which I'll cover more on the next slide, is that the revenue, all of the net revenue, uh, would be returned to the U.S. household as carbon dividends. So this is a critical point, which we'll, which we'll cover in a moment in more detail. Uh, the third point here is that we have carbon border uh, border carbon adjustments, meaning to uh, to keep the uh, fair trade and, and open trade uh, fair. So foreign companies that export carbon intensive goods to the U.S. from a country that does not have a carbon price equal to ours, they will pay a surcharge to make up the difference. And on the flip side. Uh, U.S. companies that export carbon-intensive goods to such a country uh, will get a refund for the carbon fee difference. So everybody stays at an equal playing field here. Companies importing and exporting are not getting, getting harmed by this. So basically what we're talking about here is something that rewards producers, consumers, and other nations if they emit fewer greenhouse gas. Now, if we, uh, if we look at this dividend approach, what we have here, as I said, you're putting a price on the sources of greenhouse gases. The result of that, of course, is that prices will increase. You know, all, you know companies are going to absorb about 15% of that, that increase in their cost before they start passing it on to the rest of us. So prices will increase. Uh, for the energy, you know, from ComEd that we buy, people's gas, uh, housing prices, transportation, food, clothing, those prices will increase. But those, 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 that increase in the price can easily be offset by a dividend. And it's that dividend minus the increase in expenses that each household will have that provides each household with a net gain or loss. And I'll talk about uh, with that in a moment, but you know, primarily the low and middle income households, because they buy less, they have a smaller carbon footprint. Therefore, they have a smaller increase in expenses. They come out with a net gain. And that's what, that's what this chart shows. So if you look at, hold on one second, let me just take a drink of water. Uh, if you look at households, if you have two adults and a minor, let's say, uh, and then you have the five income quintile from lowest uh, to highest income, uh, here's their annual dividend uh, after taxes going across here. Here's the average increase in monthly cost. This is, this is uh, averaging, average increase uh, overall in annual cost. And again, because you, you have your higher income, as your income goes up, these people are buying more things, more boats, more cars, more vacations, more clothes. So that's why their costs are going up. Uh, but then you'll see the bottom three income quintiles come out with a net gain. Even, even when you talk about the, uh, you know, the higher incomes, they're generally experiencing a, uh, although they generally experienced a net loss in this study, the impact is minimal. And 12% of the households, even in this category, come out ahead with a benefit. 42% experienced a minor loss. So uh, main point here is, uh, you know, the, our, the prices of our goods and services will go up. They will be offset by a dividend. Uh, people in the lower three income, the first three income quintiles will come out ahead net gain. And we're not even yet talking about the, the health and environmental benefits as well. So uh, what are the, you know, the benefits of the act? One is effective, as I said, uh, you know, the, the goal and the way that this has been studied, if, 
if you start at $15 a metric ton and increase X amount over time, the policy will reduce emissions by at least 50% by, we should not by 2030 anymore, but let's say by 2032, because we're a couple years behind on this, unfortunately. And then we can be at net zero emissions by right around 2050, let's just say 2052. Uh, it is supported by economists and scientists because it's simple. Uh, it just causes the system to change and lets the market take over, which is why it's effective. Very little government intervention here. Um, it's, it's good for the economy and good for the people. Uh, from an economic point of view, we can create 2.1 million, $2 million new jobs over the first 10 years. That's greater than a 1% increase in employment uh, that we would get without the carbon C and dividend. And this is simply from spending the dividend. This is not from the market effects that will cause an increase in alternative energy jobs. That's something else we'll speak about in a moment. Um, but you know, speaking about that, I mean, you know, jumping right into that, you know, if we look at the job situation right now, we have 850 people. 850,000 people in the U.S. in the uh, renewable energy uh, that are employed in the renewable energy renewable energy industry. Uh, that compares to 50,000 coal jobs in the U.S. right now, uh, as of 2020. You know, some of the jobs that we're talking about as the market takes over and people are looking for cheaper sources of energy, alternative sources of energy. Uh, we're talking about jobs like building and installing more wind turbines, solar panels, and other renewable technology. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at building fleets of electric vehicles. Uh, there's work in a modernized fuels industry to supply grid power, uh, capturing carbon in the air, capturing carbon in the sea, transporting it, transporting it to storage locations. Uh, and so that's from an economic point of view, very good for the, the country the, and the people. From a, a health point of view, what we're talking about here is just in the U.S. alone, uh, poor air quality causes an estimated 60,000 U.S. deaths each year and sickens thousands more. Um, you know, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act uh, would reduce harmful pollutants significantly uh, because these people at these choke points are, are emitting a lot less CO2. Uh, but the result is, you know, very harmful pollutants like nitrous oxide, mercury, reduced 75 to 95 percent, respectively, in, in, in 10 years. Uh, the act would prevent roughly four and a half million premature deaths, about 3.5 million hospitalizations, and about 300 million lost work days in the U.S. over the next 50 years. So I, I'm giving you, uh, you know, numbers on uh, on how we can help X number of people's lives, uh, but you know there are other numbers here in my notes that I could pull out that talk about how do we equate that just also to dollars saved. Um, and then the, we have to talk about, you know, the obvious, uh, you know, the thousand pound gorilla in the room here. Well, what, you know, how do we get everybody on board to do this? And uh, right now, not everybody's on board. We know that. We're going to talk about what's happening in Congress right now in a moment. But we can get in the right climate, and I'm not talking about 10 years from now, I'm talking within the next couple of years, we can get Republicans and Democrats on board on carbon fee and dividend. Uh, a few reasons for that. One, it's revenue neutral, uh, so it's, and it's good for the economy, and it's also good for the health of the people. Uh, it's also a very well-kept secret in D.C. that many Republicans are quietly supportive of action on climate change, but they're just afraid of the retribution of it right now. Uh, they need our support in that regard. You, you do have a Republic, you know, a number of Republicans, 24 uh, on, on the climate change caucus. Um, we can look back at the, uh, 
at the end of the Trump administration, uh, I think it was in December of 2020, Trump signed the $2.3 trillion spending and virus relief bill. That actually included a lot of climate measures uh, that garnered bipartisan support. It, it extended tax credits for clean energy industries that promoted clean energy R&D. Uh, you know, another reason why this can be bipartisan if the grassroots support is strong enough, and that's what's got to drive it, and we're going to talk more about that, is carbon pricing is supported by all former Republican chairs of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, except for the last administration. Um, and then if you look back in history, uh, major legislation uh, from an environmental point of view, the, the EPA starting during the Nixon administration, the Clean Air Act of 1970, the Clean Air and Water Act under Bush 41, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, that, even that one had a, a cap and trade amendment in it that required coal fired plants to scrub sulfur emissions before it, it, it exits the smokestack. This was to combat acid rain. Uh, and so consequently, between 1990 and 2004, sulfur emissions fell 36% and power output increased 25%. So uh, point being here, I, you know, there, as long as we can build up the grassroots support to help make change, we can get uh, Republicans on board, albeit a difficult task, but we can make it happen. Um, if I if I just if we just set aside this particular act for a moment and look at well we we what I've just talked about is you know benefits in the U.S. from a health and economic point of view a health environmental and economic point of view what if we take a you know what happens if globally uh, we switch to a clean economy just simply doing things globally actually like much of Europe is doing now, like Canada is doing now, like what I'm talking about from, from this uh, uh, the, the Carbon Fee and Dividend Act that I just mentioned. If we do these things globally, we're talking about a higher global GDP growth uh, to, the, to the size of a whole nother U.S. economy over the next 10 years. Uh, that means another 65 million new low carbon jobs. Uh, a very large increase in female employment and labor participation, about 700,000 fewer air pollution related deaths. Um, and then uh, from a, I, the other point of view that I'm referring to there, uh, you know, this at a high level, what we're talking about here is, you know, at one and a half degrees warming, and we're trying to limit it to that. Uh, is, you know, there are significant risks to human health, livelihood, food security, human security, water supply, et cetera, economic growth. Uh, all of those risks will increase significantly if we hit two degrees of warming. And, and we're, we're really trying hard with the environment, with the act that I mentioned, uh, with everything that we want to try to do in Congress in the next two months, in the next year, uh, to, to limit it to one and a half degrees Celsius. Because if we go more than that, the the the, uh, the ramifications are quite quite higher. Uh, it's going to lead to even even more climate emigration, refugees, regional conflicts, uh, less human security, less economic, less food security. It's a national security issue for us and for everyone around the globe. I mean, we are talking about more economic, uh, more poverty. Uh, more heat-related illness and, and, and death, uh, significant increase in drought, uh, significant decrease in water availability, uh, you know, and so on down the list. So, you know, this is the global impact. We want to avoid these things by implementing that global economy, green economy. But you have to, you know, you have to, add, you know, it took a little tangent there looking at things globally. Now I'm I'm back to the U.S., uh, you have to say, well, is this even going to be, is fee and dividend going to be accepted? Um, the answer is yes. 
Uh, and, and this just doesn't get publicized enough. Uh, Two thirds of American voters support a fee on carbon with revenue returned to the household as a, rev as a regular dividend check, a monthly dividend check. Uh, Democrats are higher, 80% uh, support it with 15% that don't, you know, it can be swayed either way. Uh, Republicans, 53% support it with another 22% swayed either way. Republicans under 40, no surprise, because they're the ones under, everybody under 40 is looking at a very bleak outlook if things don't change. So they support it at the rate of 75%. Um, you know, here's another, another poll, a uh, vast majority of Americans think it's important that national climate solution be bipartisan. This is exciting because uh, I think uh, the majority of the population wants a more bipartisan working government. Uh, they want things to get done. Uh, this can be one of those bridge issues to get back into getting regular work done at the government level. Um, you know, uh, all voters, 80% want a bipartisan solution. 83% of Democrats, 75% of Republicans. Uh, so this is a good thing. This can help motivate those in power to, to make change. You know, what, what, is this accepted in other parts of our society? Look, uh, from a, a local government point of view, you have uh, you have the United Conference of Mayors, you have cities from Anchorage, Chicago to Miami that are very much in support of this. You have a number of corporations here on the right, uh, but let's not kid ourselves, that support it. But let's not kid ourselves. Shell, BP, uh, Conoco, ExxonMobil, these guys are also spending an enormous amount of lobbying money on the fossil fuel side of the house. So, uh, you know, it's, we just need to be aware of that. Um, well, where are we in Congress today? Uh, and, and we're getting to the end here. I, I just want to take a step back and cover a couple of points that, some, that sometimes get conflated and a little confusing. Uh, but just from a point of reference, uh, we we had the, uh, the the you know December of 2020, we had the three the 2.3 trillion dollar bill signed by Trump that uh, with a virus relief package that also had, uh, that also had uh, money in there for uh, climate change investment. Uh, in March of 21, Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act that, was, uh, that extended the COVID-19 program. The other big bill that he signed was the Inf Infrastructure Investment Act, November of 21, 1.2 trillion. And you know, there, there, the, 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 of course, there, there were efforts to pass the, a Republican-Democrat climate change bill, but never, you know, those did not succeed uh, for obvious reasons. Um, we, we might always get 51 votes, but even that is a challenge, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. But even if from a, with a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. You've only got a majority by one in the Senate, which uh, a Republican filibuster would uh, would really talk uh, essentially talk any bill to death because you need 60 votes to get something out of filibuster or end that debate. So where do we go? What does that mean? Well, if we can't if we can't pass something uh, through regular procedure, uh, reconciliation is available. And uh, what reconciliation is is a a uh, once or twice a year, uh, you can have a bill uh, that includes policies that change spending or revenue only. It cannot be filibustered. So you just need a simple majority, 51 people. And if we look back at the, the evolution of what's been happening in this, putting together this reconciliation package, uh, as of October of last year, you had a significant group, uh, influential group, the leader of the Senate, uh, the leader of the Senate Finance Committee, Ron Wyden, uh, agreeing to put together a carbon fee and dividend in the bill. Uh, and it was integrating a number of critical points from Senators Durbin and, and White House Act, essentially a carbon fee and dividend. Uh, 
since that time, uh, for negotiation purposes with Senator Manson from West Virginia, those points were withdrawn, and we ended up with a bill that uh, that had a lot of investment in uh, climate change and investing in new technology, uh, giving tax breaks, et cetera. Uh, but that was rejected by Senator Manchin, he's a Democrat from West Virginia, as of uh, the 15th. Uh, so as of right now, there isn't, there are, there are not any climate change elements in that reconciliation package that would be put up for vote in September. Um, Biden did announce a new climate plan, pausing on federal drilling and ramping up wind, solar, and other clean energy projects. But you know, he's the executive branch. He's very he's limited in, in the impact that he can have uh, in this. This really needs Congress passing laws uh, to support major change. Uh, so what do we do? You know, um, I'm going to I'm going to get to the action in a moment, but I, I want to, which is the second to last slide, but I want to conclude this one with. Uh, you might say, you might be thinking, well, even if we can get something passed in reconciliation, even if we can get some senators uh, from the other side to come over and join up on reconciliation, uh, even if we can get some investments in uh, clean energy, if we can get some tax breaks for clean energy, uh, et cetera, what's going to happen when the Republicans are in office? Or what if the best thing in the world happened and we got, we got carbon fee and dividend done in reconciliation? What's going to happen when the Republicans take over? And look, they may take over Congress in the fall. Uh, right now, they have a very good chance of taking over the House. Uh, they have about a, an even chance of taking over the Senate, and they've lost momentum there in the last three weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a moment. but. Hey, look, if they take over, when they take over, whether it's this fall or next uh, or two years from now, um, there is a good chance that uh, whatever is passed now will stick, will stay. Because as I said earlier, many Republicans support serious action on climate change. Uh, it's, it's much easier to ignore what's already been passed and not change it than it is to put your name on a bill that says, I want carbon fee and dividend. If you are a if you are a Republican, uh, it is revenue neutral or what they can pass can be revenue neutral per the dividend I talked about. Something very, the Republicans will be very much in favor of. Uh, and as we've seen in the history of the last hundred years, members of Congress are very reticent to take away benefits, in this case, dividends from both voters. So can it stick? Very good chance. Uh, no guarantees, but no reason that we shouldn't try. So, how does this tie into what we ought to, what we can do right now? And this changes uh, every couple months. And I, I updated this based on the new information that Manchin is not supporting reconciliation. And let me get a drink of water. Um, contact our senators, Duckworth and Durbin to reach across the aisle and get a climate deal done as part of reconciliation. Uh, don't focus on Joe Manchin. Uh, I think it was kind of a waste of time to spend so much energy on Joe Manchin when he's, proved, when he, when he's shown his true colors over the last year on this. Um, you know, uh, he is one of the highest paid recipients of fossil fuel campaign funding. Uh, there is plenty of evidence going on in West Virginia to say that people out there want to, that they support uh, alternative fuels. They want more invested in their state when it comes to alternative fuels. You could do a deal with West Virginia and give, give West Virginia more dividends, give them more investment, make that transition easier for them, make that transition easier for Southern Illinois and other coal producing places. But Manchin, it, it's just not working out. So what do you do? You focus on others. Um, you, you can focus on, uh, I think, you know, those, there are Collins, Murkowski, Romney, these people supported the certification of the election, supported the January 6th committee. Romney, I believe, just had a, a pretty tough article in, 
uh, the Wall Street Journal about, uh, I, I don't think it focused just on climate change, but he mentioned it as a critical thing that needs to be addressed. Um, what about focusing on those that have nothing to lose? They're retiring. Roy Blunt of Missouri has crossed party lines many times. Portman in Ohio, he's retiring. We need one more person to come on board. Uh, and uh, so my, my point here is that we can all once a week reach out to these people and uh, especially you know Durbin and Duckworth to say reach across the aisle, look. And and this is not a CCL opinion. Now I'm going to give you my opinion, so I don't get CCL in trouble. But you you can you can contact you can get on these senators' website and tell them what you want. Uh, you can uh, you know the, 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 you know you, you don't always have to be a voter in the area to to submit your thoughts. You can donate to their um, to people that are running, uh, well, we'll come to donation in a moment, but uh, key thing is to reach out to try to grab one more person across the aisle. Um, you can email President Biden at this link. I'll get you guys a copy of this presentation. You click on the link and you can email him. Uh, that's that's short term for reconciliation, trying to get something done in reconciliation. Uh, just beyond short term is November 22. Uh, the obvious thing, you know, whatever your position on this issue, whatever your party, just go vote. We need more people to vote. If you're passionate about this issue, whether you agree or disagree with carbon fee and dividend, if you're passionate about climate change, get out and vote. Uh, and, and help get out the vote. You know, make the phone calls, canvas door to door. They even have texting, uh, you know, if you're uncomfortable door to door or making the calls. Uh, sending out postcards. These things really work. Um, talk about it with friends and family. You know, you're, you guys are talking about it. You invited us here today. Uh, silence breathes inaction. I, I, I want to make a point on that. Um, there was a, uh, a study done in 2018 uh, called the Experimental Evidence for Tipping Points in Social Convention. And this suggests that the opinion of the majority can be tipped to that of the minority once the latter, the minority, reaches 25% of the public. Well, the um, uh, you know the the the, the, the at least 36% of Americans think that addressing climate change should be a priority. Uh, you've seen how all the other people feel that they're in favor of the fee and dividend, they want bipartisan solutions, but we're already at the tipping point. So when you get to that point, as you talk more about it, as you as you discuss things, as you call your Congress people, that's when things flip to now the majority of the public wants this. A couple of recent examples. Uh, same-sex marriage rose from less than 40% support when Obama was elected to over 60% when he left office. Uh, in early summer 2020, the percent of Americans who think that thought that police are more likely to use excessive of force against African Americans went from 33% to 57%. Things can flip. Things can change when you get enough momentum going. I think a lot of you guys, you all probably know that based on the issues that you discussed. Uh, Here's another one that most people don't talk about. You know, we, we all get those annoying polling calls. What do you support? Who do you support? What, what, what issues are important to you? They're very annoying, but answer those that ask about what issues are important to you. All that information gets fed into algorithms. They figure out really what percent of the country wants climate change policy. What percent of the country wants carbon fee and dividends? What percent of the country wants this type of gun control, this type of immigration reform? Uh, politicians pay attention to the top five issues. They just don't have time for anything else. So we, we've just got to get into the top five, uh, to, and, and that certainly helps. Uh, but donate to campaigns, uh, join CCL, and again, you know, the words that we speak uh, lead to movement, which is where we're at, which, which leads to change. And uh, this CCL has, has uh, according to uh, Senator Whitehouse, I don't have the quote in front of me, but really brought carbon fee and dividend to within one vote of passing. Uh, 
we've done a lot of work in this area, but it's not just CCL, it's, it's other organizations as well, making this an issue uh, up front for the, uh, you know, our, elect, our elected officials. So we're, we're close to change. So I, you know, really what we've uh, wrapping up here, uh, just wanted to give you the overview of CCL, explain what the issues are, uh, talk about carbon fee and dividend, a little side trip down to what what if we could implement that type of thing worldwide? Uh, can, is it acceptable to people? Where are we in Congress? What actions can we take? So I, that's all I have. I went a little bit over, um, but thank you for your time, and I'll you know certainly take any any questions that you have. All right, everybody, I'm going to unshare your screen real quick here, sir. And uh, all right. All right. And then we're ready for uh, questions. Um, I know Ellen, if she's still here, had her hand up earlier and I took it down, but I'm not sure if she's still here or not. But anyway, who's uh, my first question to you, Mike? OK, Brian, I'm going to let you go first. I'll call. I'll go later on. So, Brian, go ahead. Show yourself. Um, so I recall this carbon dividend uh, being promoted by people like uh, James Baker and Henry Paulson, like the same people that did the financial crash, like the ones who are responsible, most responsible for the financial crash. Those are the people supporting the carbon dividend. And as I read the literature, there was an indemnity of liability for the oil companies for the the damage caused by the use of fossil fuels so in the context of this carbon dividend is there you know somewhere foreseen that there would be some like acceptance of liability of the oil companies uh, by the taxpayers thank you uh, I, you know, Brian, I'm not aware of that, and I, I so I, I'll say I don't think there is uh, any anything in the bill. And it, well, let me take a step back. So you're just so I'm clear. Your main question was: Is there anything in this in this particular bill that would hold oil companies somewhat responsible for the current issue? That there would they would be indemnified for oh, or indemnified. Uh, against you know that the taxpayers would assume a liability to clean up any of the any of the mess from the use of fossil fuels that that was part of the deal like in order to get the oil companies to get on board they needed a you know indemnity and and that's that's what I recall as part of that Henry Paulson uh, James Baker publication that they were putting out that all this stuff is based on. So it, it's like, you know, you're proposing, you know, suggesting this legislation, but that legislation is going to be part of a thousand, two thousand pages that, that you're really not going to know what's in there. And that's what I saw um, was this indemnity. And I was like, yeah, okay. So, so basically the taxpayers are going to pay this carbon tax and, and agree to bail out the old companies all at the same time. I mean, it's like, yeah. I, Good you know, I, I, I know that uh, so uh, Baker and Paulson are part of another group uh, and I top of my mind, I don't recall the name of it I, right now, but they do support carbon fee and dividend, but they have some other uh, points in, in their in their plan. I'm not aware of the identification. Now, when it comes to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, uh, I don't, I, I, I won't say with 100% certainty, but I'll say with 99.5% certainty that there's nothing in there that would indemnify the oil companies uh, yeah. for any of the mess that they have in this particular act, uh, nor would I support anything like that. It's one more question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so there's already the EPA, the Bureau of Land Management, to the water people. I mean, it's like the government and taxes have been, you know, regulating and taxing for the benefit of all this pollution and emissions and all the rest of that stuff. I mean, this has been going on since 1970, you know, pretty robustly. So if, if it is now turned into a crisis, what makes you think that more taxes and more government are the solution to the problems that 
government and taxes and regulation have failed to have, have you know, I, now it's a crisis, right? They're regulating it for 50 years. Oh, and now it's a crisis. Well, why is it? Why is it a crisis? I mean, yeah. you know, you guys were on this for 50 years. Why is it a crisis? But yeah. oh, but you get, you get some more money and, and some more regulations and other bureaucracy. Now you'll fix it. So, well, I, why? Why would it? Why? Why do you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think that uh, so the you know the private sector, the government sector, everybody's been uh, sticking their head in the sand for the last fifty years about this growing problem and pushing it off to the next generation. Um, but that's the I, EPA. Not, so that's their job. That's their responsibility. Well, well, well there there are a couple of couple of points you made. So. I'll, I'll come back to the EPA point and uh, make a note. Um, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, from a, uh, this, when, when we talk about carbon fee and dividend, uh, the only thing that the government is doing here is one changing tax policy to try to influence the private sector, the market economy, as they do in a number of areas. Um, you know, and and so the idea is change uh, change tax policy to influence the, the market. Let the market take over. Let the market do what it does best, which is find the the best solutions at the most cost effective price. And and in the process here, because they're doing that, you know, dramatically decrease carbon emissions. So I I disagree that this is another big government program. Uh, it's just a, a tax policy. Now, the part that the government will control is, uh, is, is it's just simply administering the program um, in that, um, you know, they're, they're implementing the, the, the tax policy and they're monitoring that. And however, they monitor all tax policy. And then they're going to cut a check to households every month, like they, you know, cut a, you know, a social security check. So there is a fee to do that. You know the, the the overhead rate at uh, operational cost of let's say Medicare is a three percent fee, so maybe it's a three percent fee that they've got to charge just to operate getting that check out the door here. Now, what why I like this more than the EPA doing more is two things. One, uh, I don't think uh, I, I'm not a a uh, big fan of this current Supreme Court, but I think they ruled correctly a couple of weeks ago when they said the EPA does not have the authority to uh, make such a gross, meaning large, extreme change to the way the economy operates by telling companies they must move to alternative fuel. They have a limited scope based on what Congress feeds them. Now, um, so I think uh, I, I would like them to stay in their limited scope. I would like the government to stay out of this effort as much as possible and just let you know the market system take hold. Okay, did you get your you. questions answered there? Uh... I, I did, thank you. All right, Dan and Ileana, you're next. Go ahead with your uh, question. Okay, my question is, uh, thank you for your talk. But uh, my question is about it's about carbon credits. Uh, you've maybe you've heard about Corteva, which is part of I think Dupont or uh, a, whoever makes uh, glyphosate uh, Roundup, um, whatever the company is. Anyways, it's a German company now. Anyway, so um, the, they pay something like $30 per acre for farmers to put in, taking the carbon out of the air and putting it, I mean, out of the air and putting it back in the ground, basically. So when they leave the, when farmers leave the land empty, all the carbon goes into the air. So when they put a cover crop on, it keeps the air, it keeps the carbon in the ground, takes it out of the air. So are you aware of, of Corteva doing that? That's my question. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not aware of how that I'm not aware of how Corteva does that. I mean, I, I have some 
I mean, what you're talking about is carbon sequestration, right? Just putting it in right. the ground. Okay. Right. And I and I have some opinions on that. I, I think one is, you know, what you described is 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 a very I think ineffective way for uh, to sequester carbon. Uh, you know, you really you really need to have the optimum geological environment to trap carbon. Uh, many facilities that do this just do not have that optimum optimum uh, geological environment. Uh, and carelessly sequestered carbon, like what I think you're referring to, easily can leak back into the atmosphere. Um, and, and based on what I've read, up, uh, and I haven't read anything on this in the last two months, but the best scenario up until at least two months ago was 90% effectiveness. So if we do find that optimum geological environment and we sequester carbon properly, we're still only sequestering 10%, which so we're still emitting, emitting tons of carbon in the air. And then, you know, one of the other challenges, the way they do a lot of carbon sequestration today is uh, most of the carbon that is captured is often put into tapped oil wells to improve the oil recovery. So now, Oil is recovered when it's burned. That's yielding, you know, more CO2 and, and more uh, sequestered carbon in the first place. So it's 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 definitely there are people out there that are working long hours and spending a lot of money on how do we sequester carbon well, and and how do we how do we take it out of the air today and out of the sea. Uh, and hopefully we see some big, big results, but uh, nothing to speak of yet. Okay. All right. Um, all right, Charlie, you're next. Yes, uh, Mike. Wouldn't it be simply a lot easier to impose a significant fine or penalty on any corporation that pollutes the environment and use the revenue generated for eco-friendly activities such as financing public transportation. Uh, I mean, if a company puts out gas guzzling SUVs, make them pay so much per vehicle and then use that money uh, to provide uh, excellent public transit service in the metropolitan areas and, and smaller communities across the nation. I, you know, it's a good question. I think um, my own, you know, this is my own personal opinion on on that is th this is where if we have to rely on the government, uh, in this case the EPA, to do even more fining and more tracking of who's polluting, now we're creating uh, a really big, uh, a, a much bigger bureaucracy and. And I, I'm more in favor of just if we, with the carbon fee, uh, we, they implement that and then the market system just automatically takes over and the government can just uh, stand back. Um, I, but, you know, you're, you have a legitimate point. Um, and, uh, you know, one way or the other, uh, we have to figure out, you know, we, we, we have to uh, figure out the best way or ways, you know, there will be a lot of compromising to reduce that carbon in the air. Uh, did, Charlie, did that answer your whole question or just part? Yeah, I, I see the point. I, I mean, you talked about forest fires. Well, we have to have the United States Forest Service to fight those fires. Right. So why not let make the polluting corporations, capitalists pay for those firefighters? Well, and I, I, I think or pay, uh, if oh, there's flooding, make them pay for FEMA. I think, and I think indirectly they are in, with a carbon fee in that because these people, these companies, these major choke points where they emit significant amounts, significant amount of carbon are going to pay a fee, uh, you know, they are paying one way or the other. Uh, and you could do it the way you're suggesting, you could do it with a carbon fee, uh, but I, I understand your point on that. Okay, um, 
Mike, I have a question for you. You know, while fossil fuels have contributed to the degree about one war one degree of warming in the last 170 years, isn't it true that climate related deaths are at an all time low thanks to fossil fuel development? Uh, no, I mean, the, uh, you know, the numbers that I, the numbers that I put into that, uh, into that presentation are, are solid. I mean, uh, those are what about 60,000, uh, premature deaths every year in, in the U S. Um, what you, what we have the opportunity to do is reduce the, the number of premature deaths, reduce the number of, uh, health issues and, all the costs associated with that by by removing a significant amount of the carbon out of the air. Yeah, but as, isn't fossil fuels are still the development source of energy around the world, and they're still growing fast. And isn't it true that while much hype renewables are scoring, causing skyrocketing electricity prices and increased blackouts, take for example, AKA Germany, and now they're burning more coal than they've ever done because they shut down their nuclear plants. Um, you know what? I think uh, actually, if you could, if you don't mind, I'll share another slide, and I'll, I have some. Go ahead. I have some uh, points on that. So it's a good question. Um, am I sharing the slide? Yeah, you're sure you're sharing your screen, but that's uh, you got the whole screen up, not just your uh, slide. Bear with me a second here. Just, just go, go to yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now you can see the. Okay. Yeah. Um, here, uh, I I pulled out a few key points because this this comes up a lot, and you know people often ask, and I I try to get this straight in my mind too. Like, uh, you know, what is happening in alternative energy today? How quickly can we use what's available today to to to, to move to alter, you know, to uh, net zero? Um, and I was just going through some notes and I pulled out a few key things. Um, uh, let's see here. I'll uh, make this a little bigger. Um, kind of an eye chart, bear with me here, but just a few key points. So right now the combined solar and wind power capacity, it's quadrupled since 2010. The cost of generating power from solar has dropped 90%. Wind power is cut in half in that. Price of wind power has been cut in half in that time. Uh, in Australia, Tesla has implemented very large batteries that are outperforming fossil fuel generators on both performance and cost. South Australia is, is quickly on its way to 100% renewable energy. So without any technological innovation beyond what's available today, uh, you know, using our current renewable energy and energy storage technology, we could meet up to 80% of global energy demand by 2030, 100% by 2050. So this gets at, you know, how do we transition? Well, we're in a great place to transition over 10 years and then to 2050. Now, there is a, uh, um, uh, a myth around nuclear power. Uh, Germany aside, I mean, we've got our issues with, with Russia, Ukraine, and all of that, and, and they have not transitioned. We have not transitioned to alternative energy enough, but our, the average new generating cost is 100 bucks per megawatt hour versus 50 for solar, 30 to 40 for onshore wind. Um, and, and this information that I'm sharing is current as of 2020. Uh, renewable energy costs are now competitive with fossil fuels. And keep in mind that we're not in, we're not in, we're not investing in, in renewable, renewable energy, the degree to which the government invests in fossil fuel, the, you know, with the, with the tax breaks for the oil industry, the coal industry. Uh, we're, but even with that uh, millstone around the alternative energy next, so to speak, they're very cost competitive. Um, you've got here in the Q1, Q1 of 2020, um, you know, for the first time, uh, uh, renewables out, out competed coal and power generation. So 
we, we're, we're in a better situation than I think we all we all realize to to move forward. Okay, that's that's reasonable. I'm. We'll just ask one more corollary to my question since nobody seems to have a thing. Are you familiar with the work of Alex Epstein and his book? Um, fossil fuel sure, and why global human flourishing requires more coal oil and natural gas not less i i am not but i'm uh, i'm writing it down i'll take a look at it mm -hmm. it's just it's just it's just real interesting i mean you know i'm not saying that you know i too am an environmentalist i too recognize global warming as a problem but the only well, anyway, I'll, I'll I'll get into that later. Come on, guys, we got we got we got people with more questions out here. I'm sure. Here, I, here's a here's another point that I just found fascinating. I, you know, I I think uh, you know, regardless of what one thinks of CNN, I think mm -hmm. uh, Fareed Zakaria is a pretty practical guy, a, a well-read guy, and uh, he made an interesting point back in October. Uh, 5% of the 29,000 fossil fuel plants in the world produce 73% of the emissions. Just that statistic alone, I mean, we could easily pay to convert 1,400 plants and get this huge windfall, uh, you know, from decreasing carbon. I, I just find it's just a very interesting point. Uh, I haven't fact checked what he said, but, um, you know, he's usually very well sourced. So. And, and, and uh, Tim, um, mm -hmm. and to everybody, speaking of books, I, there's a good one here, uh, The New Climate War by Michael Mann, M -A -N, N. And I, I think it's a really good book because he, he, uh, he is not painting the doomsday scenario that a lot of people are, though we are looking at catastrophic situations. But he, he's also really well sourced. The, the bibliography is, is huge. And uh, a lot of very good information about kind of where we are and how we get out of it. But um, looking at looking at everything, nuclear, uh, okay. et cetera. Yeah, I've, I've got it up on Amazon on my other browser. It does look good. I mean, you know, this yeah. is okay. Um, all right, we got a couple more questioners now. Uh, Bob Matter, and then we'll go to Jan Bodart. I'm going to unshare your screen if you don't mind again, sir. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, uh, Bob Matter, give us your question and uh, please go ahead. Yeah, Mike, you know, I've often heard the I've often heard this phrase that that fossil fuel companies get tax subsidies. Do they get any? I mean, are there special tax breaks designed just for them, or are they just taking the same kind of you know legal you know tax write offs that every business is allowed to, like depreciation and you know, employment taxes and, uh, you know, expenses for their, you know, their bills, et cetera. Yeah, I can, uh, I mean, I can speak with certainty about the oil industry uh, and, and um, you know, that fossil fuel industry, they do get a lot of uh, tax breaks above and beyond, you know, the subsidies of uh, tax breaks above and beyond what the typical business gets. Uh, and, you know, they also have one of the most powerful lobby groups in Washington, D.C. I, I'm fairly certain that the coal industry is in the same situation. I just can't say to what degree. Okay, and one other question. Where, where are you from, by the way? Uh, from uh, a suburb, uh, Glenview, just north of Chicago. I live in Chicago now. Okay. Great mistake taking away that airfield. They should have put it into an airport. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. All right, uh, Jan Bodart, you've got a question. Are you? I'm sorry, Bob. Finish your point, Bob. I'm sorry. Bob, Familiar I with the? Uh, uh, I can figure out how to do a question here about Illinois. I'm trying to. I was trying to share my share your screen. screen. I have a chart, uh, but. Okay. Well, Bob, go ahead and share it if you can. Can you share my? Yeah, you you got you got permission to share your screen, Bob, but your internet connection is also kind of uh, a little bit um, how shall we say iffy at this point. Okay, I want to share the desktop. Uh, yeah, it won't let me. It gives me a, a choice of cancel and share. 
and only cancel is uh, highlighted apparently. Oh, my, that might be. Oh, it, oh, it, oh, it, oh then never mind. Wait, I, I figured out Hit a different button. There we go. So here's here's the uh, here's the average temperature in Illinois for the last hundred years, and you notice that the green line here, the trend, Illinois, the the average has been has been like fifty one point nine two degrees. The the trend is going down. You see about in about nineteen sixty five start getting colder in, in Illinois mm -hmm. rather than warmer. What's, what's the reason for that? What's the, what's this? Okay. So the stores is the uh, NOAA, the national ocean. Yeah. Uh, national ocean. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is a really good store. Um, I, you know what? I, uh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, it's, it's through 2009. Certainly, we were experiencing climate issues uh, before 2009 that you would think would show up in the charts. Uh, I'm just looking at the uh, the red line here. So you got average temperature, actual temperature. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I can't. I I really can't speak to exactly what um, what would be. So you're glad you because I. There's, I, Bob, you're still you're, you're um still spotty coming in with your internet, so please repeat. Bobby, you still there? Okay, um, we'll wait for Bob to come back again. Uh, Jan, you got a question? Why don't you show yourself again, please, real quick, and uh, we'll uh, be ready to uh, go with you. So, Jan, please give your question. Um. Well, I've been listening to um, Guy McPherson, and <coughs> I've also been listening, to, uh, went on the Climate Change Film Club, and they both claim that the pollution put out by fossil fuels puts particulates in the air that uh, reflect the sunlight and increase the albedo of the, of the world which of course is being destroyed by the loss of the uh, ice in the North and South. But um, personally, Guy McPherson says that when, when and if fossil fuels stop putting that particulate in the air, uh, it, he personally says he'll get so hot that he won't, you know, that he wouldn't survive. That's just personal. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, but the, Climate Change Film Club has a whole section on albedo. And um, I'm wondering if the people who are, well, like me, really against uh, fossil fuels, uh, understand that it's possible that it could change the albedo and cause the global warming to increase a great deal. Uh, you know what, I've, I've um... I'm not familiar with the term albedo, but I have heard uh, I have heard about the position that there are these particulates in the air that the fossil fuels emit, and these particulates reflect the sun back into the outer atmospheres and keep the Earth cooler than it otherwise would be. I I've heard of that, but I I I, I just haven't seen any evidence that there is any any real there's any real science behind that so i i just respectfully disagree with that that point of view entirely and i mean on the contrary the evidence is very clear that you know we can look at different isotopes in the air and we can see the ones that just through science we can determine that based on the different types of isotopes in the air we can see that climate change has been caused by uh, all of these, uh, you know, the CO2 in the air and, and, uh, and, and if it what had not, had not have, would not have been there, we, uh, we would have actually seen a bit of a cooling on the earth because it is really creating this greenhouse effect that is reflecting the heat down into the earth. So if you can eliminate or dramatically reduce that greenhouse with good climate change policy, that heat is going to naturally go back out into the uh, uh, much of it will go back out into the upper atmospheres. Now, if we made all this great change to 2030, we're at we're at uh, half 
emissions, 2050, we're at net zero. It's still going to take hundreds of years to change what we have created to this date. Uh, but at least we will put a, we'll have put a cap on it, um, you know, as far as putting more into the air. So I, I understand your your question there, Jen. I just I I just don't agree with Guy and the other gentleman on that point at all. I, yeah. Well, it's not another gentleman. It's a group called the Climate Change Film Club. Oh, okay. But anyway, uh, I wanted to talk about albedo because when we look at the moon, the the light from the sun is reflected onto the Earth from the moon, and um, the amount that the moon reflects back is called the moon's albedo. And uh, we we uh, all the planets have an albedo because they don't produce their own light. So anything that reflects light has an albedo, and it's a A L B E D O. Um, so uh, that's a, that's a very important um, scientific concept in light science um, because you can tell sometimes what the surface of another um, non-reflecting, uh, the surface of a non uh, of a non uh, light generating, I mean a reflecting surface, what's on the reflecting surface because of the albedo. And another thing is you can determine the Earth's albedo when the moon is dark because some of the light reflected from the Earth is gonna hit the moon and bounce back. And so, um, that's how the albedo of the earth is determined um, by uh, examining that reflected light. That's one of the ways, it's the ways, the old fashioned way. Um, so um, uh, anyway, um, it's something, it's something worth, because I'm not taught, when you use the word, uh, you use the word isotopes, and then you talked about carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide is a compound, it's not an isotope. Um, and um, the brown particles and the black particles, uh, I, that, I think that's what they're called. Uh, this guy, um, Mark Z. Jacobson, talks a lot about brown particles and black particles. And I'm telling you, he knows more about the atmosphere than God. Oh. And, uh, and so, um, uh, you, you know, those brown particles and those black particles, they're heavy. They're, they're like dust particles. They're not even the size of molecules like carbon dioxide or methane. Right. And so they're going to be uh, falling. And, okay. and so, uh, you know, they, they have gravity. And um, so I think albedo is a thing to be considered. And if we do get rid of... Um, if we do get rid of fossil fuels quickly, uh, according to Guy and according to this Climate Change Film Club, it could hurt us. Hmm. So, okay. okay. Jan, thanks a lot for the comments. We do have uh, Charlie next. Appreciate everything in there. Uh, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead and answer your question. Yes, uh, you may ask a question. I, I may, I may, well, uh, Charlie, you know what I mean, Charlie. Yeah. Get a little crazy. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the full, the full All right. I constantly I saw that South the sweatshops in Southeast Asia, operated by free market capitalism, soon will be flooded. Now I constantly come across this that the world, the sea levels across the world will rise. Now the state of Illinois is bordered along on the on the west by the Mississippi River and its tributaries. And Chicago is situated at the confluence of several rivers and of course, adjacent to the Great Lakes. Is there any real, I don't see this covered too much, possibility that this could result in flooding in the metropolitan area? that we live in? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I started giving this presentation uh, about three years ago, you know, one of the points that I made, and, and I just didn't make it today because I don't have an update, but, you know, the, the city beaches and parks 
uh, have been hit with record high water levels. Um, we've seen, you know, we had seen storms that pushed 12 foot waves on the Lakeshore Drive. Uh, the, uh, the Chicago Park District put together an emergency shoreline protection project at Junaway Beach, about 10 miles north of downtown with other projects to follow because of flooding. Uh, so there is, you know, we're, we're the, I, I don't, nobody is talking about, you know, uh, significant, uh, significant flooding of the city of Chicago. I mean, I'm talking, yeah, we, we are, the Lake Michigan, and there are different causes and effects here, but in general, uh, this, this rise, this damage has been due to, you know, climate change, but there are issues with where Lake Michigan dropped a bit too, uh, as part of some natural cycle, but when it has been going up, it's been going up higher. So I guess to answer your question, Charlie, yes, there is concern that uh, more beachfront could, can be taken up uh, with, you know, what will become just the standard, you know, uh, part of the lake. Um, but I, I, you know, more, I, I can't speak to it more than that. I, uh, unfortunately, I just can't get, you know, any more specific than that. Uh, certainly we've seen issues of flooding on the Mississippi as well, but does that answer your question? Well, I was just curious, uh, the Green Party's running candidates for the water, re water reclamation district. And I was wondering, is there any possibility in the future that the operations of that municipal municipal operation could be overwhelmed due to climatic change. Yeah, I mean that's uh, you know that that's possible. I, I mean I and I used to do some uh, work with the Chicago Water Reclamation District. It had nothing to do with climate change, but I'm familiar with that big deep tunnel project. You know, if, if I was on the board of the Chicago Water Reclamation team, I would I would say, okay, what's our plan here? We have to consider what's happening with climate change, which means we have to consider the more extreme storms, the, the more water we're getting, you know, from the rain, uh, you know, and how do we how do we handle that? How do we manage all that through our our deep tunnel system? And how do we do we need to expand that? How how else do we need to prepare? So. I, I would think who's ever running uh, for that board ought to have uh, a few key, you know, a few ideas in mind, uh, and, and that ought to be addressed on a regular basis. Yeah, at least be qualified to run. <laughs> yeah. Never, yeah. Never, never, never mind, Mike. All right, um, uh, Ellen, you had a question. Ellen Corley, are you there? Because you had your hand up for a question, and if you're ready, I can take you now. All right, um, Ellen, if you if you're there, I'll I'll let you go next. But uh, who else has a question? Doug Binkley, you haven't said anything either. Um, where do you see Mike? Um, I know you've gotten carbon taxes and other things as part of your solution. What do you see as uh, the best way forward as far as uh, you know maintaining an industrialized society as well as as well as combating climate change? Well, um, you know, uh, you, you have, I, I, I think the carbon fee and dividend is the cleanest, simplest way to go because it, through a, a simple tax policy change, it lets, the, it lets the free market capitalist system take over and adapt. So it is going to uh, force you know, per the points I mentioned, it'll force those people that are polluting at those key choke points to find other sources of energy, which will help drive the the alternative energy economy. Um, and if we're using alternative sources of energy, uh, we're doing two things: we're cleaning up the environment, and we're that the jobs opportunity here is just so big. Where this is a significant positive economic impact of the country. Um, and then uh, from a purely, uh, if, if you use the dividend approach, now you're giving money back to the public uh, that really positively helped, that, that helped the, especially the, the, the bottom three 
income quintiles where they come out ahead. Even though the price of goods and services will go up in the short term, they're going to come out ahead. But uh, I, I, you know, I, I just I think it's the simplest, cleanest way to go. Um, okay. Yeah. All right, Mike. That you you definitely tried to answer my question. Okay, Brian Dahenny, next, please. Oh, I, so if you tax the oil companies, they're going to pass the cost on to consumers. It's just going to cost people more. That's what they do. So you know this idea that you're going to tax them and and then they're going to give a dividend to people. All of that is going to be reflected in the price people pay at the pump the price people pay for the use of fossil fuels. So, I mean, what you're doing is you're trying to price fossil fuels out of the market and, it, you know, use that money to incentivize um, <clears throat> alternative fuel sources. How, how, is, how does that create jobs? I mean, you're, you're creating, like right now, the market runs efficiently. It's, it's built uh, for fossil fuels. And it's, it's designed that way. Everything runs that way. So by creating an inefficiency, how are you creating jobs? Because you're consuming resources that would otherwise be used to create jobs, but you're not, now you're using them for this purpose, this other purpose, which is inefficient. How are, you, how are you creating jobs? Where'd you get that nonsense? That's reality. I think... Uh, and Brian, I think I just, I, I fundamentally disagree on a couple of points. I think one, um, you know, the, the history of capitalism is, is littered with examples of where a, a more efficient, more cost-effective solution A to B takes over solution A. Uh, and, and, and so what we're talking about here is the same thing where now the oil companies are going to be able to pass on. I mean, if you look just in general, uh, based on these studies and how businesses operate, uh, I mean, the business that I'm in today, we can only afford to pass on so much of our increased cost before we start losing consumers, before they start going to alternative sources. So as an oil company, I think what they need to be aware of, and, and frankly, what I think they're planning for, and I think they're actually well suited for this, given their ability to do project management and make investments, is, um, you know, if, if if they keep passing on higher prices to consumers, you know, based on how that market system works, consumers are going to start shifting to other ways to, how can I how can I get my energy more cost effectively? I'm going to go to alternative sources. How can I well, what I'm saying, though, and what I think you're, you know, that you're, you're not taking account of is that trucks delivering food, trains, planes, you know, some, you know, power plants, electrical power plants that get their source from natural gas. I, I mean, it's like, I think when you're, you, you, you talk about these solutions, you, you don't talk about the monumental cost that is going to be incurred by the consumer. And what you're, and what you're, you know, what you're advocating for is basically what you're saying is don't worry about it, consumer. We're going to throw you a bone. We got this dividend. But the, the cost of that bone is the regulation of all this carbon and higher prices on food, on entertainment, on everything, on electricity, on travel, you name it. So, you know, I agree. Well, I agree, right, that there is something that needs to be done. The solution you guys propose is like hidden, uh, you know, hitting it with a mallet that you can't ever get rid of that this tax and this regulation is going to be there forever. Some politician is going to, oh, just a little 3% administrative costs. That's what Charlie lives on. He loves to hear that. Those nominal administrative, that's his pension, 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 pension. Uh, I mean, it's like, just let us do this little tax. We'll do this. They've done it for 50 years and now it's a crisis. I, I think so. There are a couple of key points. One, 
right now, all the evidence is clear that we're paying a lot more for these climate change problems than, than the solution itself. So one way or the other, uh, everybody's paying. We're paying uh, in, in uh, you know, the, the cost. Of every As time goes on, we're all going to have to be, be paying more to absorb the cost of these solutions unless we... The cost why why can't the government change. do what it needs to do on the the existing tax base? What it's been what it's been promising to do for fifty years? It's well, obviously not done. You got, it's a crisis. You let me we're, well. Let me finish the, the other point though. First, I think I think you bring up some valid points, but right now the cost of the problem is greater than the cost of the solution. So who's going to bear the cost of the problem? We are all bearing. It. That's that's one point. That's a theory. What is, where are the numbers? Where are the facts? What, what, what did I pay today for climate change? When I, when I went to the store and bought a taco, I can how much, give you how much the, of that, the cost can, of the taco is, is because of I climate can, change? You know, but you know what? I, uh, part of that can, cost of that taco is the oil prices because you know the beef had to be shipped in and the avocados had to be shipped in. Right. I mean, as we go on, I mean, you know, the when, but but back to the other point though, we're we're um, we're incentivizing an industry to change because the by penalizing the consumer ultimately we're not we're by penalizing the consumer. Brian, hey, Brian, I'm gonna I'm gonna I just need to finish my point, and you can go go ahead. But here's my point on that: um, we're not penalizing the consumer. the The consumer is getting a dividend. And as the economy, as as these as these as these manufacturers of energy and these companies that use, that manufacture goods and services that use all this energy move forward, they're going to be paying a higher tax to use all that fossil fuel energy. So two things are going to happen: they're going to pass on some of that cost to the customer, not all of it, just based on the history of capitalism <laughs> and and competition. Secondly, that is going to incentivize a lot of other industries, a lot of alternative uh, energy companies and businesses to operate and become more efficient. And as in, in eventually, we're going to have this switch to where we're just we're operating a lot more cost effectively under the alternative energy environment versus the fossil fuel uh, environment. And I, I mean, I went through a number of those stats where, you know, the Today, the, the technology is available today to operate more cost effectively. We're just not we're just not using it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, are you, uh, oh, uh, Tim, sorry, Brian, did you have a did you have another comment on that? Yeah, I, I mean it's it's like you're you're measuring theoretical costs that might be incurred against actual costs that are being incurred right now. We're experiencing it. The cost of everything has gone up because they shut the pipeline down. They stopped the fracking. Okay, hey, hey, there you go. Price of everything went up. You know, shut the shut, shut the supply lines down, and now everybody's suffering for it. So you know, I, I mean, it's like you, you now, and it's like all this this carbon talk. It, it's just like it reminds me of Y two K. It reminds me of you know global warming it reminds me of the ice age you know the little ice age it's just like hysterics and theoretical costs that someone is trying to turn into an actual tax and a bunch of government jobs so that people like charlie can have a pension that's okay. it no I, I appreciate the perspective i do i, I you know i i, uh, I disagree i mean and if, if, if i wish i wish i could talk to you over a beer and, and, uh, and talk to this, but i i i, did, I disagree on a, on a few of the, the on a few of the critical points there i, I think the other part is and, and and what what i'm referring to here is is also something that's been looked at in in detail by in, not just environmentalists but economists and you know, and, and how, you know, what is this? What is this price per metric ton going to have the impact on on the consumer? How much do they pass on typically? What does this kind of dividend do? How long is it going to take? And how many dollars are we going to have to increase the metric ton to the point where we now have flipped over into a 
the most cost effective operation for the consumer, which is the, you know, the alternative energy and more environment. And then I do have, and I, I can't find it here. Uh, it's buried in the notes, but I, at a macro level to your point about, you know, the numbers and, and the, the number of disasters and the cost of the disasters are now, you know, costing a lot more than the solutions themselves. And I think where we all will, if, you know, we all feel the cost, maybe not yet, but eventually is, you know, higher insurance rates, certainly in, in this inflation environment aside, uh, you know, uh, higher, higher, higher gas rates, uh, higher healthcare rates, the, uh, eventually, the consumer pays for it, you know, one way or the other, to your point. So I, what I'm suggesting is, I think this is a more cost-effective way to do it than the current way. But anyway. Uh, okay. So can I, can I make one more? So I lived in Winnipeg for a year or so. You live where? Maybe two years, Winnipeg. Okay. And so, which is a city of 750,000 people in the middle of Manitoba, right? Mm -hmm. If it's like water that froze over and then it's ice for seven, eight months out of the year. And I watched all the trucks coming and all the smokestacks with smoke. And I thought without fossil fuels, there's no way this city could exist. No way. All, everything had to be shipped in from somewhere else by rail, by you know plane, by truck, everything. And it, because it was a massive population that there was no manufacturing base. I mean, things had to be shipped in. So, you know, thank you, petroleum. I'm, I'm so happy to be warm and fed. Thank you, petroleum. And I get it. And my, you know, I understand that. It, but, but now, and, and I was going through that one slide where I, I identified a few key points that are, I think are just very interesting about alternative energy that gets lost in the noise. And right, you know, one of them right now is that renewable energy costs are now competitive with fossil fuel. Even when you consider the incentives that are skewed against the renewable. And so, uh, and, and even much lower than nuclear. So I think we have to take that equation. I think Winnipeg and Canada is big on on uh, you know cap and uh, I forgot if it's cap and trade or uh, fee and dividend, but uh, you know they're seeing very good results up there. Um, Winnipeg would be a great a great example where what they're doing in South Australia with those big batteries could help out you know fuel the grid in Winnipeg. Yeah, that's that was the issue. That's the issue I heard is the, okay. the battery the storage of the energy. Like, All right, the battery uh, cost is expensive. All right, we appreciate Brian. You um, in there, uh, Charlie? You're next. Go ahead with your question, please. Yes, I've uh, long known that uh, the United States has an oil-dependent transportation network. Now, aren't companies have an option I to produce a product to ship it by means that is eco-friendly? Uh, the they have a choice. Now they could choose either trucks or, or, or other methods such as relatively uh, ecologically friendly rails networks. So there appears to be little or no incentive. It's been somewhat based on the, the items that they're shipping, um, such as somebody who produces a truckload of, of iPhones, they're very expensive. So they don't care what it costs uh, to ship. There's got to be something to make the manufacturers adjust their methods. Uh, the market is not working in that regard. It's an abject failure of free market capitalism. And the price we pay, allegedly, this is enabled for profits only to bypass the market. But there's got to be some measure, don't you think, to impose some discipline upon the free market in terms of the pollution that they are responsible for? Well, I and I'll be the first to admit there are plenty of failures with the free market system. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, that's where government has to a good function and government has to keep an, an eye on 
uh, what's happening. And but I I still feel that uh, I, I still feel that you know letting that. And this is where I think we we have a fundamental disagreement. I still feel that the market system is the most efficient way to operate uh, to get the best quality goods and services at the best price to the to the people. Um, so I, I would say let the cap let the uh, carbon fee and dividend approach let you know let it go and, and let it do it change the market system accordingly and let it let it do its thing. I think that, um, you know, from a business point of view and, and the company that I'm with were, and I'm seeing it all over uh, around the world, I'm sure we all are, the, the huge supply chain problems are, you know, our, our shipping costs have gone up enormously. We're trying to, but, but we're, we can only pass on so much to the consumer, uh, the customer, we have to find more ways to be cost effective. So I think we're, we are motivated. I think the market is motivated to do to find a more cost-effective way to ship product. Um, there still might be some way, some place there. I, I, I don't know to, you know, certainly the EPA does find companies that are polluting beyond what they're allowed to do. But uh, I still think Charlie, from my perspective, but I, I think we just, just, just disagree that the free market approach with the uh, carbon fee and dividend would be a, a cleaner, simpler approach. Okay, uh, did you get your question answered, Charlie? Well, in a sense, I still don't understand if a company produces a product and then use a mode of transportation to deliver that product to the market that they can pollute the earth and say that that's efficient. Well, in the case of in the case of this carbon efficient, feed, if you want to pollute the earth, I guess. No, I, I and that's where I think the carbon fee and dividend approach would help dramatically reduce the pollution, because you know those people that are at those main choke points, uh, which is you know the people that make the energy, the people that use the energy to make, the people that spend a lot of the energy, use a lot of it to make goods and services, and in, in your case, Charlie. Uh, a choke point could very well be, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, maybe it's the rail system that's polluting like crazy, uh, or some transportation networks that are polluting like crazy, delivering products. That might be one of the choke points where the uh, where they decide to implement uh, a fee to encourage them to reduce their their pollution, to encourage them to do things in a more cost of, uh, in a more using more alternative energy sources. Uh, you know. Uh, Anyway, but I, I yeah, I, I, so I think that's why, from a transportation perspective, whether that fee is placed upon the transporters or the people they're buying product from, you're going to see a, a dramatic reduction in, in, uh, in, in pollution. Okay, um, I'm going to take the liberty of asking one more question. What's your stance on nuclear? Um. I think uh, you know I, I'm not against using it. Uh, I think it's safe. Um, I think that uh, you know all of the I would I would much rather see us spend our time investing in uh, wind and solar, alternative other sources of energy. It takes a lot less. You know, it takes uh, it takes 20 years to get a nuclear power plant up and running when you consider all the work that's done ahead of time to get that local government, that state government, that federal government to approve it, and then to build it. There's an enormous time issue there. And, and the cost of, you know, the power, the nuclear power generating cost is about a hundred bucks per megawatt hour compared to 50 for solar, 30 to 40 for onshore wind. So um, I'd like to see us focus more on the latter. Uh, but in, you know, if, if we have a gap in our ability to move to uh, 50 percent by 2030, 50 percent reduction by 2030, 32 and net zero by 2050, uh, I would think nuclear would have to be considered um, as to fill that gap. Existing nuclear plants, it probably doesn't make any sense to put new ones out there given the cost of alternative energy. 
Okay. Is that the end of our question period now? Yeah, let's go to rebuttals. Okay. All right. Uh, thank our speaker. Yeah. Well, let's thank Mike Ryan tonight. Mike, we appreciate your call coming tonight. Uh, obviously, you're informed because, you know, uh, you had things. Now, I'd like to know who's got rebuttals tonight. Now, Mike, stick around. You're going to have the last word. So I know Charlie's always got a rebuttal. Jen, I know you got one. So hang on. Charlie, Jan, who has a rebuttal? Who else has a rebuttal? Brian? Okay, who else? Uh, we have Charlie, we have Jamie, and Brian. I know Charlie likes to go last all the time. Uh, who else? Um, Bob Matter, okay. And, uh, um, all right, so uh, what we'll do then is I'll give you guys... Uh, um, since it's only 8.03, I'll give you guys about seven minutes or so, because I think if we can be a little more generous with the small amount of rebutters we have, I may do one later on. So what I'm going to do is going to go Jan first. Uh, we're going to, okay. No, uh, I, I, can't, I can't go first. Okay. I'm all right. All right. All right. Ed Rios is there too. So, all right. Uh, we'll go Brian. We'll go Bob Matter. Then we'll do uh, Ed Rios, and then we'll do uh, Jan, and then we'll do Charlie. Anybody else want to pipe in? Uh, if not, I'll give you guys. Let's just be generous with the. Uh, we'll be generous with the seven minutes tonight. So uh, if anybody else feels like doing a rebuttal, uh, pipe in and let me know. So again, that is Brian. Bob Matter, Ed Rios, Jan, and uh, Charlie. Okay, Brian, uh, I guess you go first. We'll give you seven minutes on the clock. All right. And uh, go ahead. I don't know that I'll need seven minutes, but. But you know what I mean. I'm just saying, you know, by the time you might have a little back and forth with the speaker, we'll be a little bit. Right. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, imposing a tax and, and a dividend you uh, what you're you're setting up some legal structures some government structure that's gonna you know some department some bureaucracy that's going to need to be paid and they're going to need a pension and they're going to need health care and they're going to need time off i i mean it, it's like and, and so you're creating this inefficiency you're cre you're causing things to cost more to the consumer in a, in a significant way on a lot, a lot of different products. Like the effect you're having on the price is enormous. So, you know, I, I think, you know, I can see, like I saw the, the water levels of Lake there, Lake in uh, Nevada by the Hoover Dam, like it's the water levels down, there's a drought. Like, you know, I, I'm not someone who, is incredulous like i mean i i believe that carbon can have a significant impact on our environment you know warming or cooling i i don't know you know i think the the amount of uh, things that americans consume you know i i i laugh about a bag of munchos you know i love munchos but it's like a toxic waste bag and then full of air and then like an inch of chips at the bottom, right? And then, so this bag of chips went through this whole process, created all this waste, right? So that I can enjoy an inch of chips and throw that thing in the garbage, which will sit for a, a thousand years, right? And I do this regularly, right? And I'm not alone, <laughs> you know? It, it, it's like the ultimate for the American would be like, you know, Amazon comes, you know, late night, drops a, you know, drops a bag of chips at your window when you got the munchies, you know? It's like everything's on demand, you know? Immediate gratification, you know? Optimum waste, right? For immediate gratification. We have an entire culture and civilization built on that. Our economy is based on that, right? Let's put money in the hands of consumers so they go out and buy shit and they'll create jobs, right? You know, so, you know, the, these ideas, you know, it's like if you want to affect the climate, you know, I think you're going to have to do a little bit more than imposing a fucking tax and taking people's money and subjecting them to some, some regular, you know, I, I mean, you, you know, let the free market work, 
But, you know, Americans, you know, individuals have decision-making power. They have the boycotts, they have embargoes. I mean, you don't have to buy these products. So, you know, it's like if the only solution ever presented is tax, regulation, government, pension, <clears throat> you know, nah. I mean, find, find another way. That's all, that's all I'm saying. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, do you, am I supposed to talk now or wait? Mike, oh, what we'll do is you'll get the last word in after okay. all these guys in here. Okay, uh, Bob Meta, you're next. Uh, I'll reset the clock for seven minutes. And uh, go ahead and get started when you're ready, Bob. Okay, so um, so we recognize that climate change is, you know, is important to find a solution to and all that. But I think the, uh, the problem is, you know, we're tr trying to do it overnight. And we're nowhere near ready for it. And what the Biden administration has done is, is you know, plunged us into an unnecessary catastrophe here. Uh, now with inflation, great, probably more, more harm than, than good in the long run, I think. Um, you know, we could have had a, you know, stable program of working towards these goals without having to do this, uh, you know, sudden, uh, you know, hit, the, you know, stomp your foot on the brakes and throw everybody through the windshield uh, method that uh, we've done here. Now, also, we also need to be careful here that I think a lot of this, uh, you know, fight against climate change is really part of the American Marxist anti-growth movement. Uh, you know, they, they want us to pay more for gas. They want us to drive less. This is the, I'm talking about the elites now that run the Democratic Party, the, the coastal elites. Uh, you know, they want us to stop living in single family homes in suburbia and having a yard and grass for our kids to play in and a barbecue grill and a swimming pool and all that they want us to move into multifamily housing in the city and to start taking public transit instead of driving and you know living where we want um they want us to stop eating meat stop eating steak or stop eating beef because you know cow flatulence i guess has some impact on on global warming and they want us to start eating bugs instead of meat they want us to start eating in Tax, that's the big plan and they're going to switch us over to tofu and you know seaweed and all this other stuff um but you'll notice that these these democratic elites it's always rules for thee not for me they're not going to leave their coastal mansions like barack obama just bought a mansion right on uh in massachusetts on <laughs> right in martha's vineyard uh, you paid, I don't know, 10 million or 30 million or something for it. Uh, shows you how worried he is about global warming. Uh, and all these other elites, they live on the coasts. They're not leaving their coastal mansions for multifamily unit apartments in dangerous blue cities. And they're not giving up their private airplanes and their jet style, their jet, uh, you know, jet set lifestyle like Al Gore and all these guys flying around all over the world, Jim Carrey, or J what's his name? Uh, uh, Massachusetts Senator Carrey, John Kerry, you know, flying all over his private jet. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not riding a bike or taking a train. They're still going places in their limos and Cadillacs and, and all that. And you can bet your ass that, uh, Guys like Gavin Newsom and and uh, Pete Buttigieg and and uh, Kamala Harris. So you can bet your ass that they're not eating bugs; they're eating fucking filet mignon, shrimp, and lobster, and having uh, the most expensive wine that can be flown over from France. So hold on to your wallets. This just seems like another Democratic power grab. Trying to uh, 
use anything they can for an excuse to reward their democratic donors, which are all these companies that make solar and wind stuff. And of course they're, they're masters in China who uh, I guess Biden is an employee of um, through his son. Uh, so, you know, watch out for what's really going on. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, uh, all right, Steve, why don't you just go ahead and uh, Ed Rios, you're next. And if you'd like me to add you to the list, Steve, I will. Okay. Hi, can uh, you hear me? Yes, Ed, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. Here's an article from the journal. I don't know if you can read it. Maybe it's backwards. We can. Refiners expect to enjoy windfall profits on gasoline. It's Friday's paper. Um, the huge cash flows from their core business will translate into gargantuan profits as the companies report the results beginning next week. They expect eight independent refiners will report a 600% jump in earnings per share on average. ExxonMobil this month said its fuel making profits could climb to about $4.4 billion in the second quarter compared with an average of 800 million for the same period from 2017 to 2019. There's, there's, it's, it's, it's easily understandable when they're getting five bucks a gallon that these guys are making all the money in the world and 750 a gallon in Europe. Um, the, someone put up a chart of the average temperature in Illinois saying uh, how it was drifting lower over the past hundred years. I'd like to see the same chart for Texas, which had an incredible freeze a year and a half ago and ha now has an incredible summer. Um, you'll get an average also. And whatever happens in Florida and the Southwest, we're not talking about weather, we're talking about climate change. It's the climate is changing and we think we know why, the carbon. Now, as far as being an American and everybody saying, I remember in America where they, people thought they could do things. They thought they could change things. And what I see now is a lot of Americans that say, we can't do anything. That, that's not the America that I'm part of. And the final last thing I had to say is, and this was, this occurred, this occurred to me, a, oh, a long while ago. But it was to change voting rules, both locally for like uh, municipal elections and state elections and, and nationally change the voting age. You can start voting at 13 and you stop voting at 80 because it's the 13 year olds, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds who are living in a few, who have a future to look forward to that could change things because they know that they have the, their, their future is being upset. The 80 year olds, we just don't want to see anything change. We're happy with the way things are. Just let it run out. It's not my problem. I won't be here. You know? So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay, Ed. Uh, thank you very much. And we appreciate your uh, your uh, comments. All right, Jan, if you're still there, uh, you're next. Jan Bodart. Uh Seven minutes, Jan. Pardon me? Seven minutes. To the dismay of the last speaker, I'm still here. <laughs> and I'm 85. So um, I would like to refute what he just said because I care terribly about what's happening in the future. And I also wanted to say that uh, Brian Dennelly, I agree with him a great deal because it's almost impossible to avoid using um, packaging that is going to enter the um, landfill. 
and cause the horrible situation with plastic pollution that is, um, you know, we had a whole session on that here at College of Complexes. And I showed my pictures of dead birds whose bodies have decayed around a pile of plastic that they ate. Um, and another thing about that is that um, people love to have mylar balloons and rubber balloons that they have for parties and celebrations, but those things go up in the air and they burst. And then this pollution comes down to the earth and it is a huge problem, not only for human beings, but for the animals that live. Uh, you know, there's a picture of a, of a um, turtle that grew with a, a, a beer, those one of, one of those nylon beer things growing around it. And the turtle is a hourglass shape because it grew on both sides of that. So um, I don't think that, I don't think we can do anything about that. I think there has to be leadership from the people who manufacture these things to say, and to lead us into not using them so much. Okay, so what I, what I actually want to talk about just now is um, a new study that has been done. Um, and the people who participated in this study, uh, one of them is Allison M. McFarland, who was uh, uh, head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a couple of years. And um, now she teaches in, in British Columbia and she participated in a study that showed that, um, okay, first of all, small modular reactors don't exist in the United States, uh, except on Navy submarines. But there's a whole lot of noise about making them to take, to take around to, to obscure places to supply energy for people who don't have a, a supply of energy for themselves and to bury them in the ground in all kinds of spots. And, um, and then um, never, never go back and see them again after they have uh, served their lifetime. But the study's three authors contend that they sought most complete and independently verifiable information available and the data challenges the industry's backlash points to a key problem in assessing a poorly understood component of the technology of small modular nuclear reactors. Small modular reactors will not alle alleviate the burden of nuclear waste. More likely, they will make our nuclear waste issues worse. Today, the Energy Department has backed 10 advanced reactor designs and uh, not only that, but the NRC has licensed new scales. They licensed new scales when the cooling system was incomplete. And that license application does not require any paying any attention to the waste produced by small modular nuclear reactors. The, um, the waste is, it, you know, you don't have to put in the, application for a license, what you're going to do about the waste, or how much of it there will be, or what kind of waste it will be. They don't even pay attention to it. So um, anyway, the, the uh, energy department is spending billions of dollars to demonstrate that the technology can work. But the US nuclear waste policy hasn't budged. The situation has forced current operators to store 86 thousand metric tons of waste at 75 power plants in 33 states. Um, anyway, this study, and I'm putting, I'm going to put the uh, link to the study in the chat. Uh, the study said that, oh, because in the first place, there aren't any small modular nuclear reactors. They had to go by the data that was produced by the manuf those 10 manufacturing companies. And they found that um, given the data that they had available, the small modular nuclear reactors would produce two times up to 30 times the amount of radioactive waste per kilowatt hour that is produced by 
the 95 big reactors that are already that have already produced this 86,000 metric tons. And, um, and anyway, I wanted to report on that study. Um, shouldn't you understand the waste impacts of an energy source before you launch into that energy source? Wouldn't that be responsible? Those are the words of Allison M. McFarland, who was at one time the nuclear, uh, uh, okay, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Oh my goodness, I forget, uh, or I, I lose my words. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, said this, the study is just a first effort toward understanding the amount of waste that would be produced by small modular nuclear reactors if they were ever if they ever came to fruition, personally, I don't think they ever will. I think they're just a way of bilking the government out of money and, um, you know, uh, they're all a pipe dream. Anyway, uh, that is my little speech and I'm now ready to be quiet. Okay, based on what Jan says, I'm gonna do a quick rebuttal myself. You see, um nuclear power and those small modular reactors have been around since the 50s. It's called the atomic submarine. Two, more than 90% of the potential energy still exists in nuclear waste, even after five years of operation in a reactor. And used nuclear fuel can be recycled to make new fuel and byproducts. The United States does not currently recycle nuclear used fuel, but foreign countries such as France do. And the thing is, is that what's happening is that uh, used fuel, the U.S. generates about 2,000 metric tons of used fuel each year. That number may sound like a lot, but it's actually quite small. In fact, the U.S. has produced roughly 83,000 metric tons of used fuel since the 1950s. And it could all fit on a single football field at a depth of less than 10 yards. What? Yep, that's correct, Charlie. Why do they bury it? Uh, Yucca Mountain. A char you know, well, a mountain of it. Uh, Charlie, you know, the thing is, is that, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, if he's talking about the thorium reactors that I'm worrying about right now, China's got one in operation and they're testing it now and expect commercial feasibility in less than a couple of years. And when you're talking about a liquid uh, fluoride molten salt reactor, if they, they can't melt down, you know, they just can't because what happens is, is that uh, if there's an accident or something with the reactor, the salts solidify at room temperature so they don't mix with the environment. I could go on and on, but the thing is too, you know, she talks about Mark Z. Jacobson and his report about how we could go 100% renewables. Well, it's been thoroughly debunked in a little thing called the Roadmap to Nowhere. And uh, it would, it's just without nuclear as an integral part of our all of the above strategy for climate change, I do not think we could do it because we do need power and we're going to be using a lot more power for an advanced industrial society. And I just think that we'd be stupid not to use nuclear power. As a matter of fact, one of the best things you could do is support the current thorium bill in Congress right now that will establish a thorium bank where you could then get your uh, thorium all shipped to a central repository where it could be safely stored. And then they could use it for other means of commercial uses like the development of thorium molten salt reactors, as well as uh, anything else. And what would happen is that it would remove the liability from mining companies so that we could get our rare earths moving again. Our rare earths are those your ones that are used for your electric cars the things that are used for your neomagnetic magnets and all the good stuff that recycle that you want to recycle and use with. But there is such a thing that's called a thorium problem and you need to put it in a central repository and be able to use it for other purposes besides. How about the moon? Oh, Charlie, there's a ton of thorium on the moon too, you know. 
But uh, you think I've got a pipe dream? Well, I don't. Look at the Thorium Energy Alliance webpage, some of the stuff they have done. And I have thoroughly looked into this stuff quite a bit, and I'm firmly convinced that the, a major component of combating climate change is the going to these molten salt type of reactors that will basically produce, and we're not going to run out of thorium. We are not going to run out of thorium. And the thing is, at the end of life, a lot of this waste simply needs to be sequestered for about 400 years, and then we, it would return to about a background level. Now, I know we're talking about on some of this nuclear waste, hundreds of thousands of years. But what you don't understand is that a lot of it can be put right back into a reactor. We could burn up the actinides and make it safe again, as well as have a lot of medical isotopes that are currently in short supply around the world. Well, anyway, enough of my soapbox. Um, I know Jan is, wants to rebut me real quick. I'll let Jan go again real fast, and then we'll let Charlie have the final rebuttal. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, well, these reprocessing places uh, in Europe and the ones that used to be in the United States, um, they produced plutonium. And now there is a huge, um, there's a huge storage of plutonium in many places in the world. And there's no place for it to go except bombs. Plutonium is good for bombs. And to use thorium, you've got to have uranium-233. That's right. And um, uranium-233 is extremely rare, which would mean there would have to be more uranium mining. But, uh, be I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, it's 235. 233 is... Uh, no, it is not. It is 233. 233 is fissionable. If you, yes, if, if, you, if you hit it with a neutron, it's fissionable. But, right. but um, thorium can't be fissioned without uranium-233. And it you generates it, 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 it. I know the decay chain is, uh, it goes to a thorium-233, then it decays to a couple of byproducts and eventually turns into uranium-233 where you get the fission power from. That I agree with. Well, uh, I'm... I say it's a pipe dream, and I'm not going to say any more about it. <laughs> Understood, Jen. All right, um, Charlie, you're up. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, CCL, Mike Ryan, and you and your pals, putting together a very informative, detailed PowerPoint. And thank you for your efforts uh, towards the environment. I recommend everyone look them up, and if so inclined, uh, Sign up and join them. Uh, it's a good organization. Uh, okay, I'll be eclectic because usual here. I have a little issue with the basic assertion, however, that I do not believe a company should be allowed to pollute under any circumstances. To state that you can pollute and then pay some sort of penalty uh, uh, for doing so, I think is not the route that we want to go. It obviously is a compromise. You simply should not, certain things, a categorical imperative indicates that you should not do this. And there is no circumstances that authorize it or make it okay. It simply isn't. Uh, if you, you should not, they, they have to find alternative methods that do not involve harm harming the environment quite simply otherwise don't engage in that activity <laughs> there's no escape clause um it's a little bit like saying i can drive recklessly as long as i promise to pay everyone whose car i wreck well that obviously is not a permissible case as long as, yeah, I, I can drive recklessly as long as I'm responsible for any damages. I I say maybe you shouldn't drive at all is what I'm saying. But anyhow, that's just um, my perspective as a little bit on that. I, I really don't want the $241 if it authorizes some company 
to pollute the earth, keep the money. I would prefer to have clean earth instead of some remuneration. Uh, anyhow, let's see what else I'll switch to you. Um, the, uh, regarding packaging a little bit there, at one time in my life, I was uh, hired to put together a, a, a corporate library for the wirehouser company, which most of us think is lumber a lumber company, which in fact is, it owns about 2% of the United States, amazingly, largest landowner outside of the government. However, their primary activity, I was amazed, is pat was packaging. Uh, that is what the business is, and that's where they make their profits. Uh, tree growing and harvesting is, is something that's necessary there. Uh, regarding packaging as well, the real issue in packaging and I've spoken on this in other lectures, is that the increased use of uh, petroleum-based packaging uh, in products that we get through uh, increased shipping these days, which is not a good idea. This is simply petroleum-based packaging, uh, which we're seeing more and more of. Now, regarding my good friend, Timmy here, I spoke to the new people NEIS, Nuclear Information Service. Um, there's a minimum, according to the railroad industry, uh, estimates of at least 100,000 carloads of nuke juice awaiting shipment, which he maintains is only a little, little tiny bit, but that's 100,000 railroad cars tank cars and so forth, full of nuke juice, which no one apparently has any use for. But perhaps the railroad industry is misguided and needs to be educated by you, Tim, because they think it's just a, a point A to point B carload shipments. Uh, and they're not aware of any recycling like this. Um, the other thing you have, to, you have to realize is that thorium is just used to get a nuclear reactor going and thorium reactor is just like any other old reactor. And it has no unique features to it. Um, let's see, uh, last of all, I've heard my friend here speak several times that federal employees have undue concern about their pensions, which amazingly enough during my entire career would, had no influence on public policy. And the reason is, is that the entire federal pension, current and future, would constitute less than 1% of the federal budget. It is not a big ticket item. It is not of any concern. It is a very solvent operation. And it is not something we ever thought about. But it, it, it is not the be all and end all of career civil service employees. Um, by the way, most of whom, well, I won't get into it. Anyhow, Thank you very much. Please come again, Mike. Bring us an update on what's going on with CDA. Uh, any approach to bring an end to pollution or reduction has got my approval. So thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the time and the questions and the, and the discussion. So you got the last you. word, Mike, so go ahead. Oh, I just need to say one little thing. I'm, I'm really sorry that I forgot to say this, but the volume of, of radioactive waste is not a factor. It's the amount of radiation that's in the waste. That is what counts, not whether it covers a football field or anything like that. As, as uh, I'll never mind, I don't want to get it. I don't want to go back and forth with. Uh, with I'm yeah, sorry. I'd like to add something. Tim, ahead, you, sure. Are you aware that the radioactive waste you're talking about is not benign materials. 
It has an ambient temperature of 600 degrees. We could it's be producing, heat. we could be producing heat from it. It. It's like it's like a baking in your oven. We could be producing the, using that, that It's going to be like at that temperature forever, I guess. And we could be producing power. Well, and, and you, and who wants this stuff? Well, it's about. I think it's probably a good. Uh, in, order to, in order to have clean power, we're going to have to do something. Anyway, enough said. Mike, I know we're, we're, we're diverting here again. You get the last word, and we're going to just shut up and let you talk now. For okay. Me. Well, uh, no, I, those are all good points. I think, uh, you know, um, I, think the, I think the key thing here, I mean, I, I could, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'll stand by what I, what I spoke about, but I think what came up here today is what's pretty common in that, we have a lot of different points of view on this. I think that there's there's a uh, a big I think if not all of us on this call, uh, the vast majority are in favor of doing something about climate change. And so I think the key thing is, you know, uh, you know, compromise and bring you know starting somewhere and getting something done because we're in a we're in a bad spot. We have solutions uh, that can help us out a great deal, but we got to take action now. And uh, we've got to somehow get our uh, elected representatives uh, doing something now, both Republican and Democrat. And, and it's, uh, it's frustrating, but uh, you know, if we all take a little bit of action uh, based on whatever we think will uh, help move them along, I think that's the key thing. And I think, uh, like we would, if we were all running the show, we'd be compromising on some solutions. They've got to do the same thing. So uh, I think it was a good discussion. It's, it's, it's this kind of stuff. It's, it's one thing to present somebody, you know, one point of view, and you, you have to understand, you know, your point to really present it, but it's a whole nother thing to discuss it and go back and forth. And, you know, through that discussion, you get a lot of good points, a lot of good ideas. and everybody learns a little more. So I, I appreciate the time. I, I appreciate the discussion, really. Okay, anything else, Mike? No, that's it. Okay. Um, all right, with this, I'm going to declare the official recording of the College of Complexes at an end. If you guys would like to stick around for a little while for the uh, after party discussion, you're more than welcome. Otherwise, we'll be ready to go. Mike, you're more than happy to stay around, but at this point, I declare the College of Complexes adjourned.